First of all, thank you very much to the organizer for giving me this opportunity. So, well, actually the result I'm gonna talk about is very easily stated, so I'm gonna let you see that uh, um, a certain two category of growth and categories can be realized as a bilocalization, so as a bi-category of fractions of a category of linear sites. And well, actually I will do this for two different two categories of grotomy categories and two different two categories of linear sites. But first of all, I would like to, stop, to start with some motivation. So I work in non-commutative algebraic geometry. So in which approach? Well, let's see, we have algebraic geometry in the classical setup with our building blocks being the affine schemes. So that is in here, if we take K, a commutative ring, and we take the spectrum of this ring, we obtain the affine scheme, the parabola. But there's the third level of language here, which is category theory. So in my case, I will be considering quasi-coherent sheaves over scheme. And in the case of the affine scheme, this is just the category of modules. Okay, but now if we move to the non-commutative setup, so if we start with the non-commutative ring or algebra, then one approach could be what is the suitable spectrum. But we could, only, we could also think, okay, let's forget about the geometrical space itself and think of its realization as a category. So we have still a lot of categorical information going on. As examples, well, easily, if we have a non-commutative ring, we can still consider its category of right modules. So we can work with this. This would be an affine non-commutative scheme for me. Or for example, if we take a non-commutative graded ring with certain nice properties, because of Serre's theorem that says, well, if we have a, project, um, a, non a commutative graded ring um, with these nice properties of being generated in degree one and so on, then taking the category of quasi-graded uh, modules over this uh, graded ring recovers precisely the approach of A. So this category of quasi-graded modules makes perfect sense also for a non-commutative ring. You just fo uh, focus, for example, in taking the right graded modules, you mod out the torsion right modules, and you obtain the quasi-graded right modules, and this will be for us a non-commutative projective scheme. So, what will be my, the categories that we will be considering non-commutative uh, schemes? Well, these will be grotten categories. And let me remind you, a grotten category, if I fix K for the rest of the talk, K will be a commutative ring fixed. A K-linear grotten category is a K-linear abelian category which in addition has very nice properties. So it's co-complete, it has a generator, and again, filtered co-limits commute with finite limits, which is basically saying that filtered co-limits are exact. So what is, why do I pick these special categories? Well, the motivation is, first of all, Gaber's theorem, which says given any scheme, its category of quasi-coherent shifts is always grotendic. And on the other hand, we based ourselves in reconstruction theorems, which started for Noetherian schemes with Gabriel and has been generalized. And well, we can basically say we can reconstruct the scheme out of its category of quasi-coherent shifts. So being this the motivation, let me start with the, the goal of the talk. So first I want to construct two categories, but let me say which are the objects of these two categories. So first of all, I already talked about Grothendieck categories. Let me say what is a linear site. I fix a small k-linear category, which means it's a, a category enriched over k-modules. This means the homes are k-modules and the composition is k-linear, nothing else. And then we can define a k-linear Grothendieck topology. Basically, we consider the covering sieves as being instead of subsets of the representable, being submodules of the representable. And then we consider the analogous enriched statements that define the classical Grothendieck topology. So, as we are very familiar with taking submodules and with taking pullbacks in modules, which is all we need to generalize to this uh, setup, 
the notion of uh, the, the three axioms we put in a Grothendieck uh, topology, classically. Well, this is, and then, as usual, we define a k-linear side, a pair as above, with a k-linear category, small, and a topology, also k-linear. And, well, this is basi basically an, an instance of the enriched shift theory that was introduced by Borsa and Quintero. And this particular instance of linear topology has been analyzed later by Wendy Lowen uh, with the formation theory purposes, so really geometrical inside of them. So let me see. Well, this enriched theory let allows us, as we would expect, to define pre-shifts and shifts. So if we have um, what will be our pre-shifts, now we live in the enriched world. So we have factors from A up, now over mod K instead of sets, and these factors have to be K linear. So this is the category of modules over a small uh, K linear category. And then we, defi we define shifts in the same, in the analogous way. So basically, we, took, we take the full subcategory of all the pre-shifts such that when we have a map, sorry, a map from the representable to our pre-shift, it's precisely the same as a map from any covering shift of A to F. And this is an isomorphism K linearly. So this is for all A and for all covering shift. Okay. And then the proposition is that in this enriched level, we also have a shiftification factor. This means that the shifts are a localization of the category of modules. And, sorry, and the exact left joint is called the shiftification as well, and it's also K linear. So everything is well behaved, but now we live in the linear world. And in the, in the for Grothendieck categories, what's the relation of these objects with Grothendieck categories? Where we have the classical Gabriel Popescu, which says every Grothendieck category is a localization of a module category. And you just take the ring to be the endomorphisms of the generator. Well, this can be generalized and expressed in terms of, she of sites, of linear sites. And this generalization was done by Lowen, and it basically gives us a k-linear version of the Giro theorem, which says every Grothendieck category is a category of shifts over a linear side, and vice versa. But of course, as in the classical theory, we have many representations, which is the power of the, of the theory. So now let me explain the morphisms we're going to use. For geometric interests, I'm going to take a category GRT of K-linear Grothendieck categories, and my morphisms are going to be co-continuous, uh, co so co-limit preserving K-linear factors. You would say, why not geometric? Well, for geometric reasons, I would like to have non-flat factors. So to, have, uh, to consider non uh, rings which are not flat over the base. So that then, of course, for classical topos theory interest, one would like to consider the geometric k-linear factors, which is just a geometric factor, which in both the joints are k-linear, and of course the left exact, so the inverse image preserves finite limits. And then, what is the category of sites I'm going to consider? First, um, for the geometric interest, and with the relation with the first one, I take the objects to be the k-linear sites, and the morphisms, the continuous k-linear factors. So these are k-linear factors between the underlying categories, such that the restriction factor between the categories of pre-shifts restricts to a morphism between the categories of shifts. So I use here notation from SGA4. So sometimes it may be confusing depending on which notations you use for the pre the, for the image image or not. And well, recall this is in SGA4 and it's easily extended to the k-linear setup. If you have a continuous morphism, there's always a left adjoint to this restriction to the uh, morphism to the categories of sheaves. And in particular, as it is the left adjoint, is co-limit preserving. And then we can define for classical topos theory interests another category of sites, which I denote site sub K, with objects K linear sites and with morphisms, K linear morphisms of sites, which are continuous and in addition, this left adjoint to the restriction is uh, preserves finite limits. It's exact. 
So then, what's the relation between these two words? Well, we can define a pseudo factor from site, from the first of the, the geometrical ones, so to say, from site k sub continuous and two Grothendieck categories, which basically to each site you give its category of sheaves, and then to each mo uh, continuous morphism we associate the left adjoint to the restriction factor of um, or seen between the categories of sheaves. And then we can analogously define this pseudo factor of psi between site and topos. Now we have to put an up there because we have considered the direction of geometric morphisms to, give in, to be given by the left joint, uh, sorry, by the right joint and not the left joint. So it's the same. We have to each side its shift category and to each uh, morphism of sides the geometric corresponding geometric morphism. Well, and this we already. I'm going to explain now how we see that somehow, if we localize certain morphisms, if we invert certain morphisms in the category of sites, somehow it gives us the intuition, a couple of results that we describe now, that actually Grothendieck categories can be recovered in such a way by localizing certain one morphisms. Yeah? Yes? I don't know because I'm not uh, I'm not uh, acquainted with uh, with the fact you're talking about. So I would have to look into it to see if it's actually re our notion comes directly from rich safe theory. So it was uh, and the notion of like seeing Grothendieck categories are really like the K linear toposes. That was our intuition, but uh, it may be, but I don't really know. So well, there's this. Lem de comparaison theorem in SGA, which I will write in chief theoretical language, which was done by Lowen, which says if we have a continuous k linear morphism, such that if we have the topology on the first one, we pull it back to the second one, we recover the topology on the first one, and such as satisfies the following. Every family of maps, linear maps, from the one element in the image to a B fixed generate the covering of B in the second topology, plus a full, um, which I then, uh, wrote very vaguely here, basically says if we have a map in, uh, in B between two elements in the image, this doesn't come necessarily from a map in A, but it does up to a covering. So if we find the covering of the first element, then if we b go back, then the compositions do come back from the previous composition. And then the same for, uh, for faithful. So if we have a map which gets in A, which gets mapped to zero, then it's not zero, but up to a covering it is. So we can find the covering that such that the, all the compositions become zero. So if we have such a map, then such a, a continuous factor, then the, the restriction map is uh, an equivalence, and hence so is the, the, the inverse image. And we call such a continuous factor uh, LC morphism for lem de comparison. And well, I would like to remark that every LC morphism is in particular geometric, I mean induces a geometric morphism, so it's a morphism of sites because it induces an equivalence, so equivalence preserves finite limits, no problem. And then every morphism of sites is, of course, a continuous morphism. So we have this nice set of inclusions. And then there's this theorem, which is well stated in the Stacks project. But actually, you can deduce it for several results in SGA. And that I generalized a little bit, which says if we have a map between two categories of shifts, which is co-limit preserving, then there's a, uh, a subcanonical map, uh, sorry, side here on top, and continuous morphisms Fu in these directions, where U 
is LC, so fulfills the, the, all the axioms I, I listed before, all the properties, then we can recover F as doing first the restriction factor here, and then as U defines an equivalence, we can take this one and go in this direction. Okay? And, well, this already gives us the intuition. So we have. Excuse me, I didn't hear. Yes. It, okay. <laughs> well, what it says is basically every co limit preserving factor can be written as a span of uh, continuous morphisms between sides such that one of them, the one it goes in reverse direction is an LC. So it gives already a Gabriel Sisman localization intuition to the picture. And this whole thing can be done for the second uh, pair of categories I did. Uh, mentioned before, so for every geometric morphism, we can find uh, this F and U to be morphisms of sides, so not only continuous, but inducing a geometric morphism, such that we recover, of course, the inverse image as before, and by adjunction, the direct image like this. So we also have a Gabriel Sisman localization, but now as we are dealing with geometric morphisms, which are somehow on the other direction, we have the op there. So well, but we want to work in a two categorical world. So I want to work with a two category of growth and the categories. So let me explain how this is, uh, this is done in the by categorical setup. So well, for geometric interests, we are going to consider, as before, the two categories with the same objects and morphisms as before, co-limit preserving factors, and simply natural transformations which are k-linear. And for the, for the category of continuous, with continuous morphisms of sites, we also consider just k-linear natural transformations, so the enriched notion. And then for the classical topos theory, we take the same categories as before, and again, between the geometric morphisms, we consider the natural transformations given between the right adjoints. And for the category sides with, uh, uh, with um, morphisms of sides, we consider the natural transformations between morphisms of sides, which is also k linear. And then we have the machinery, the machinery of prongs by category of functions. So basically, prong, uh, she introduced a suitable generalization of Gabriel Zisman localization for bi categories. And well, he, she just uh, kind of find the good definition of what the, um, uh, the system like of left calculus of fractions in this setup is, and then defines the bi category of fractions in this way. So if we have a bi category and a class of one morphisms W, so it's important. We are inverting only one morphisms, and which admit a left calculus of functions, whatever this be, then we can define a bilocalization as a, a couple of a bi category and a pseudo functor, such that, of course, the pseudo functor sets the one morphisms W here to equivalences here. And the composition gives an equivalence of bi categories, which this is the bi category of pseudo functors between the, the um, localization to D with the bi category of pseudo functors from C to D, which sent W to equivalences. And this is, well, this is the definition. And, well, we have to prove it works in our setup. So, first of all, I claim this is this holds. Juan just has to check the axioms. So LC admits a left calculus of fractions in the in the two category of side uh, k continuous, and then we can prove the following axiom. So there exists the pseudo factor from side k continuous to Grothendieck categories, which sends LC morphisms to equivalences such that the pseudo factor one would obtain the other universal property of the bicategory of fractions is actually an equivalence of bicategories. Be aware these are two categories and the equivalences of bicategories, so a bit more relaxed. But in any case, the same theorem holds when we consider the classical topos theory k linear version. So we have from side two topos. And now, observe, we have also to invert 
the two morphisms. So the co means uh, the op is for inverting the direction of one morphism and the co of two morphisms. And we obtain the same equivalent result. And well, let me give a hint of the proof. Basically, well, it's checking. We use a, a criterion and then it's just purely categorical theory work, checking the axiom. So we already had the pseudo factor, which is basically taking the side, twist shifts, and then the morphism, the continuous morphism, or the morphism of sides to the adjoint pair. Well, we can extend them. In the first case, if we have, we have um, a two morphism between two morphisms which are continuous between sides, we can define this in the natural way. Well, it behaves much better for the restriction because the restriction we can compute. So if we take the restriction of uh, G S applied to a shift F in an element A is nothing but F applied to G of A. And we can do the same here. And an obvious and natural map is just taking F of the alpha in, uh, in, the, in, the element G, uh, in the element A. So then this can define naturally. And then by adjunction, we can define this one. So this one can check that it's actually a pseudo factor. Everything works fine. And then, well, we already observed this. Our pseudo factor sends LC morphisms to equivalences because we basically defined it this way. We have that it sends us to the FS to the restriction, and we saw that LC morphisms actually provide an equivalence. And finally, one has to prove that this phi satisfies Tomasini's criterion, which is this one. And I don't state it, it's five. Uh, um, five things one has to check which come very natural in order to see that, yeah, a pseudo factor which inverts a certain class of morphisms with the left calculus of fractions, uh, they define, of course, the pseudo by the, natural, uh, by the universal property of the bilocalization. They define such a pseudo factor and it gives the conditions in this one in order for this one to be an equivalence of bi categories. So when one has the hard work and purely categorical theory work, and one proves the, the theorem. And exactly the same thing works for the other two categories. So in here, it's more simple because we defined the, the mm, natural transformations between geometric morphisms as being a natural transformation between the right the joints, which are these ones. So, and basically, one does this. One has to prove which is the hard part of the proof and then we conclude. Then I would like to finish with a few remarks. Well, actually, only two. First, we can do this over sets. So we did all this work over k-linear setup because of the geometrical uh, motivation initially, but one can check that all this works nicely over sets. So one can recover a category of toposes with geometric, uh, with geometric morphisms and natural transformations as a localization, a bicategory of fractions of, of sites. And then, well, this kind of allows us to define things we want to construct in the two category of the categories, to construct them in the two category of sites, which is much more manageable. We have much more concrete data, and these are small categories. And then, if, as long as it respects LC morphisms, we can lift it to the Grothendieck categories. So that was our actually our initial motivation. So we defined the tensor product of growth and categories based on a tensor product of linear sites, which actually provides a monoidal structure in the, in the two category of, of linear sites. And then, well, we also proved that the tensor product, as we defined, uh, of LC morphisms is again LC, which immediately if there's uh, this, this uh, method of day, this monoidal localization, if you have a monoidal category, you invert a class of one morphisms, which, is, which respects the monoidal structure. What you get is monoidal, and the localization factor is monoidal. Well, Prong has developed this for also by categories of functions, but it's not published. But in any case, this immediately provides, we have the monoidal structure on sites, 
respects LC morphisms, which provides that our tensor product in Grotony categories actually is a monoidal structure. And with this, I would like to finish. Thank <laughs> you.